What makes Whiplash such a great film? When a film really works, it makes me curious. It makes me wonder if Andrew Stanton is really right when he says, stories that make us care aren't created by chance. They are created by design. But what about the kinetic sequences? The colorful characters? Am I late? Or the great performances? Are you one of those single tier people? Well, yeah, but other films have these things, but aren't quite the masterpiece that I think Whiplash is. For me, there's two reasons why this film really works. Number one, it has an emotional, clear, and focused story. And number two, it's well directed. But since all directorial choices are crafted to service and support the narrative, we end up circling back around to the idea that story is king. And this video aims to explore and deconstruct what makes Whiplash such a strong and effective narrative. Let's start with the macro. This part being the overarching, emotional, invisible through line that connects Andrew Neiman's desire and the climax. Remember, Ilya Kazan once wrote, everything must build to the climax, unity to climax. And this is certainly true for the almighty explosion that is this final sequence. But let's start with the desire. Andrew wants to be a great drummer. We can see personal choices of this even before Fletcher arrives. He's putting in the hours of practice, he admires the greats, and he's chosen, applied, and been accepted to the best music school in the country. It's the best music school in the country. So his intention is pretty strong at the start of the film, but it's the introduction of Fletcher that really brings out Andrew's more internal character need. His need to prove himself, his almighty inner flaw, his reliance on the judgment of external factors to give him some inner worth is the part of him that is explored throughout the film. Now the climax is a culmination of two things. Andrew gets a chance to prove himself as a great drummer, a mixture of his internal and external goals. And he wins the approval of Fletcher, winning the validation of the abusive relationship which he has so craved. But I'm not saying that the end of the film is a win-win for our hero, but we'll get back to that later. For now, let's use this macro story arc as the spine in which all other events and scenes hang on. So if a story is as simplistic as a hero's struggle to achieve a specific goal, then the roadblocks and the obstacles and that antagonist force has to be pretty formidable for the hero to really learn what he's truly made of. Well, luckily Whiplash has been blessed with the ultimate in bad guys, or maybe by design. Fletcher's goal is simple, to find his Charlie Parker, and by his own rationale is someone who is willing to endure incredibly brutal treatment in service of their craft. So he isn't actually looking for excellent ability from his musicians, he's looking for grit. Now tell me if this sounds familiar to the plot of Whiplash. Grit is defined as perseverance and passion for a long-term goal. Grit is conceptualized as a stable trait that does not require immediate positive feedback. Individuals high in grit are able to maintain their determination and motivation over long periods, despite experiencing failure and adversity. The emphasis on personal resilience has become more and more clear to me after multiple viewings of this film. A lot of exchanges in the film that seem like they're about music are really about testing Andrew's character. Fletcher wants to purposefully push down and see who comes back stronger. I can only imagine the years of torture and thousands of students that have been prey to this man's methodology before arriving at this moment as a well-developed master manipulator. So externally, Andrew wants to be a great drummer. Externally, Fletcher wants to find a great drummer, but Andrew has a deep need for validation and to prove himself, while Fletcher has a method of continual negative reinforcement to test one's character. Both their goals are aligned, but at the same time are direct opposites. This gives us the unbearable conflict that occupies the length of the film. One small detail that really makes Whiplash such an on-edge experience, full of tension that lasts to the final seconds of the film, is the placing of the desire in the climax. In other films we learn what a character wants during the first act, and near the end of the third act we get that action climax with some resolution for good measure at the end. 
But in that case, it means that there was time spent in the film that isn't actively on the hero's journey. And for some films, that's necessary. But for Whiplash, the desire has been set before the film even begins. And we catch up during that first scene. And without any resolution at the film's end, after that huge music sequence, that emotional character arc and that rival relationship peaks at that last final moment and then lets us know no more. This does a few things. It makes sure that every scene the audience gets to see is packed with tension and something that is meaningful to the story, rather than being set up or a fluffy resolution, allowing us to really experience Andrew's point of view and struggle. And secondly, it takes away any resolution to the story, so it eliminates the what happened next factor. And as a consequence of Andrew's actions, it leaves the audience with some questions. Did Andrew do it for himself or did he do it for Fletcher? Is greatness really worth the sacrifice? And would he have got to that level if it wasn't for Fletcher? So let's go back to design. To really understand the extreme height of this final moment and the deliberate building of progressive complications throughout the film, I have found The Story Grid a very useful book to deconstruct personal stakes of the film. Sean Coyne, an editor of 25 years and author of the book, suggests that you break down the story into scenes and then give them a numerical value based on the stakes of the character. Like the moment where Andrew misses his big chance to impress Fletcher. It feels like a big moment at the time, but what is really at stake here more than some embarrassment and self-loathing. So let's say he were at about a two for personal stakes. He gets accepted into the official band, but wakes up late. He could miss his only shot, disappoint Fletcher, be struck out of the band, disowned by the school. Andrew has more to lose, the stakes are greater, we're now about a three. He sees the threat of making a mistake and he starts to mess up, that embarrassment on a way bigger scale, we're now at a four. He has a little victory by being able to perform without the sheets, but then is immediately threatened with replacement, and now he wants it more than ever. Five. Note that as the story goes on, we can never go back down in terms of intensity and values of conflict. It must always escalate, it must always build. The bus breaks down, gonna be late, gonna miss the big show, forgot his sticks, crash, bleeding, seven. Embarrasses himself in front of anyone who will ever hire him, basically destroying his career, nine. And then defying the ultimate antagonist and potentially redefining himself for his own terms, an act of faith that could go totally wrong, ten. So when you watch the film and you get to that climax you're invested, you can't believe the unbearable tension and the inevitable face off in a way that you had no idea was coming. This is what Robert McKee calls taking the story to the end of the line. Before we move on to the best part of the film, let's look at one more structural element. Damien Chazelle couldn't just have non-stop drum battles throughout the film, although this is where a lot of the intention and action comes from. But these hero-villain face-offs are intercut with different aspects of Andrew's home life. This supports the overall narrative in a few ways. Firstly, it gives us a little more insight into Andrew's perspective and point of view, letting us, the audience, relate and sympathize with him so that we can ultimately root for him in the finale. It breaks up the constant music scenes, giving us two separate parallel worlds in which we see Andrew change in. Not to mention giving the audience a chance to acclimatize before going back into some more action. And lastly, most of the non-drumming scenes and conversations are about the film's major theme. What does it mean to be great and is it worth the sacrifice? All scenes, big and small, are a play on this idea. I call these thematic conversations, acting as different viewpoints to that central argument of the film. Comparing people who know what they want and a wandering undergrad. Is it better to die young and great than live old and never achieve anything? I need to do this, I need to sacrifice everything for my mission. This is a really effective way the story layers in complexity and ambiguity through different sides of the argument so that the film as a whole doesn't present one solid answer. Another connecting element that highlights the impact of Fletcher on Andrew is the action Andrew takes immediately after a music sequence. The juxtaposition between the drum scenes and the home scenes are kind of in conversation with each other. If Andrew has a small win, he feels good about himself, building enough courage to ask out the girl. 
If Andrew fails in the eyes of Fletcher, he grinds harder, putting himself through vigorous, maybe damaging practice. When he almost loses the position, he realizes how much it will take and lets go of his new girlfriend. Despite being super cold, he feels justified in this emotionally brutal action. Just look at what the script says at the end of the scene. But my favorite part of the non-drumming scenes is the relationship with his father. He is the outsider, someone observing Andrew's actions with no emotional attachment and full objectivity. His journey goes like this. I don't understand you. I don't understand you. I don't agree. You're doing the right thing. Unconditional love. But when he sees his son do this, he thinks, oh, now I see. I didn't see the greatness in you because it wasn't in me. Which brings us to the person who did see it in him, Fletcher. If you've only seen this film once, you're missing out because this film really is designed to reward multiple viewings and over time really starts to paint Fletcher in a different light. I mean it's safe to assume that Fletcher is pretty torturous and mean throughout the whole film but by the end of the film, his methods are rewarded. He realizes his vision of beating everyone down until someone won't take it and becomes his Charlie Parker. But this one-dimensional pure evil personification in Fletcher is humanized and balanced by a few scenes. Number one, Fletcher cries. We feel for his love of the music and a person's ambition, and we understand him a little at his core. Number two, he is nice to this little girl. And number three, the jazz bar scene. He softens towards Andrew and we start to believe a little on his perspective. But let's look again here, knowing the full outcome of the narrative. Number one, Fletcher cries because he missed his chance to get his Charlie Parker, a very selfish goal. And we also learn later that he may have had more to do with the blame of the student's death than first appears. Number two, the little girl scene is cute still a little self-serving since he tries to recruit her for his band in the future, but even that glimpse of a different side of him is brought back into full focus when he walks back into his area of domination moments later. Up, Similar to the fake guy encouragement talk he gives to Andrew moments before this happens. Subtly putting Andrew in a state of comfort only to flip moments later. And number three, the jazz bar scene. This might just be my favorite scene of the entire film. Really solidifying Fletcher as the master manipulator. On second viewing, we know all along this entire conversation is set up for vengeful, hurtful embarrassment towards Andrew, which is ultimately rewarded by Fletcher getting what he wanted, making a very curious choice of moral compass for the narrative. But my favorite element of the scene, despite all the setup, is that we still don't know how honest is Fletcher really being here. Number four, one Fletcher move that I never picked up on the first time. In the opening scene, Neiman is challenged to perform the double time swing. No, double time. Double it. Then Fletcher leaves, later to inspect the amateur band and grill their abilities, but he has specifically asks the drummers for the double time swing. Let's, uh, let's hear a little double time swing. For me, it seems like he doesn't want to see how good the drummers are at performing the beat. All he is interested in is, did Andrew get better? Was he damaged enough from his initial meeting that he went away and practiced the beat? Fletcher is looking to see if Andrew has grit and will respond and be compatible to his methodology. And also number five, who stole the folder? A manipulator such as Fletcher would know that the first guy would need the sheets. I, 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 you know this, I need the music, it's my memory, I, I, I need visual cues. And perhaps another test for Andrew, would he thoroughly learn the material? How much does he really want and how hard is he willing to work for? Now let's dig into the micro. Into the scenes and directorial choices and the visuals that support by acting as effective smaller pieces to a bigger whole. And let's get specific on the power of this shot. You know what this show is? This show is money. You're, right. so, you're so money and you don't even know it. And it is worthy of this. You couldn't plan a shot like this unless you were fully in service of the narrative. The shift in focus does all the storytelling legwork. The framing between the victim and the harasser. The timing and realization of Neiman as he sees the stakes and intensity required to play at this level. 
all that heavy lifting story wise is seen here. But let's go back to the start of this scene. So we the audience are the outsiders and new to this world and it's crucial that we see this scene from Andrew's point of view. So we cleverly cut back to him at certain beats within the scene as the conflict builds. Let's take this scene as a separate entity and pose some questions here. What is the point of this scene? The power dynamic is shown through how the band responds to Fletcher. Basically the rules of this self-contained world, setting stakes for Andrew's incompetence and showing the nasty and personal way in which Fletcher treats people. Number two, what do the characters want and why? Well, Andrew is the observer in this scene, so we the audience learn about this world as he does. But Fletcher wants to find the weakness in his band and tear it out. You were Erickson, but he didn't know, and that's bad enough. Note that he doesn't get rid of the person who is actually in the wrong. He gets rid of the person in the band with the weak character not enough grit to make it through his teachings. And why? Because his deep philosophy of only the strong and the tough and the self-sacrificing will ever have the chance to reach greatness, causing him to bully and identify weakness in people. Where's the conflict? The anticipation of Fletcher's reaction mingled with Andrew's uncertainty of what will happen when he's put on the spotlight brings the threat very much into reality. How does the scene turn? Well, Fletcher takes action by throwing out the player, and we the audience, as Andrew's point of view, learn the obstacle and dangers of Fletcher that we must overcome in our journey. How does it advance the plot? This scene acts as setup, as almost part one to the following confrontation. It's why the scene finishes with the line, All right, take 10. When we get back, the squeaker's on to purposefully unnerve Andrew, sending us into the next upcoming conflict with anticipation. The band undoubtedly know what's coming, but neither Andrew or us the audience do. But this naivety circles back round later when Andrew has this great moment of witnessing the punishment to somebody else. So why does Whiplash work? Well, every image is designed, sculpted in a way that supports the scene. And we know that every scene builds as part of a bigger whole, making a narrative that is tight, cleared and deliberately designed to move an audience. Because at every level of this film, the narrative and the direction are saying the same things. There is an integrity and a strength to the story that is married with an incredible execution in the direction. So that's why I consider Whiplash a masterpiece. So part of the intent with Whiplash was, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna write something small and focused and lean and mean and 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 really sort of simple in a way. Like hopefully not simplistic. Hopefully you can you can sort of expand it to to a bigger canvas of ideas. But the actual story itself I wanted to be incredibly clear cut and about, you know, two people with very clearly defined goals who are just going like this um, until they realize they have the same goal, basically. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this exploration into Whiplash. It's a film that I have learned a lot from and definitely a film worthy of study. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing for more. I have other videos on this channel that you might enjoy. I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters. And if you have a film that you'd like to suggest or you want to talk about Whiplash some more, then I will be in the comments below. A huge thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.